Welcome to today's webinar brought to you by Couchbase, Reltio, Influx Data, and Unravel Data. I'm Stephen Fegg, Director of Database Trends and Applications in Unisphere Research. I will be your host for today's broadcast. Our presentation today is titled Powering Modern Applications, Data Management for Speed and Scale. Before we begin, I want to explain how you can be a part of this broadcast. There will be a question and answer session. If you have a question during the presentation, just type it into the question box provided and click on the submit button. We'll try to get to as many questions as possible, but if your question is not selected during the event, you will receive an email response. Plus, all viewers today will be entered for a chance to win a $100 Amazon gift card just for participating. Now, to introduce our speakers for today, we have Rick Jacobs, Technical Product Marketing Manager at Couchbase, Mike Frasca, Field Chief Technology Officer at Reltio, Anais Dotis Joju, Developer Advocate at Influx Data, and Mike Wong, Solutions Engineer at Unravel Data. Now, I'm going to pass the event over to Rick to get us started. Welcome to the broadcast, Rick. Thank you. Glad to be here. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone attending for taking the time to attend the webinar. And here are a few of the things I'll be discussing today. First, I'll talk about modern database and application requirements. Then I'll talk a little bit about how Couchbase differentiates itself from our competitors and the benefits that you get with Couchbase, including an increased return on investment. And as time permits, I'll talk about some successful coach-based customer stories. So what are some of the requirements for modern applications? Well, a lot more people are shopping online, which means that applications have to be available 24 seven from anywhere at any time. Also modern applications look and behave differently. So traditional applications were based on static data, which was periodically updated. I actually was a developer in a previous life, and I remember having to wait for the updates to be done nightly. So the updates would usually be done about midnight or one in the, in the morning, and then you'd be coding against stale data. So every day you were coding against yesterday's data. Those days are pretty much gone. Um, modern apps now run on sometimes streaming data, which is updated immediately. So the point is data is much more dynamic now and applications need that dynamic data. A lot of modern apps offer social interactions and in-app collaborations. So you might have a chat app, for example, messaging application that allows you to collaborate within that application with other users. And then we have a lot more mobile uh, devices. So mobile applications are a lot more popular and these apps need to be location aware and they have to change the experience accordingly. So for example, if I'm running an application on my computer, the same app on my phone and then the same app on my watch, the application needs to be smart enough to recognize that the location has changed and then change the experience accordingly. Also, developer resources are limited. So development needs to be fast and utilize available skills like uh, SQL, which Coachbase supports. You don't want to have to retrain your developers on each platform. Uh, the pictures at the top of this slide from left to right actually give some examples of applications that Couchbase supports. Um, we've got the Louis Vuitton mobile catalog that allows employees to access the current catalog and inventory data within the stores. And then Staples has a similar shopping application that's personalized for the shopper. And it also is smart enough to know the inventory within the stores. And then my personal favorite is the Carnival Medallion application, which is personalized for each uh, person on the ship. It acts as a cabin key, a payment system, and it can also help you locate your family. And then it recommends activities based on a similarity algorithm. So they can recommend activities based on other activities that you've done, and then similar activities that other users have also um, engaged in. The change in application requirements means that database requirements have also changed. So the push has been for web application and mobile um, devices. 
And then there's also a lot of microservices application development that's going on currently. Legacy databases were generally too slow and couldn't maintain the massive interactions that are needed for modern apps. And then they weren't flexible enough or agile enough to scale as needed. On the other hand, NoSQL databases are built on a fault tolerant, scalable, scalable distributed architecture. And that allows the application, to, application and database to scale as needed um, based on how many interactions the application needs to support. And then these NoSQL databases are also dramatically lower than lower in cost than traditional databases. NoSQL document databases like Couchbase are also more effective because they allow the data to be stored as complete objects. So if you got a record with um, a, additional records that help uh, maintain information, you can store all that data in one object. So you can have one document with the primary record and its additional records all stored in one document, which means less trips back and forth to the database. And also you don't need to join uh, data like you would in a relational database. And then NoSQL also supports schema on read. So that means that the schema doesn't have to be set when the database is created. So the schema can be a lot more flexible and change based on the application needs. And both this fault uh, tolerant database, the flexible schema and the architecture that's behind that schema that allows for additional scaling based on requirements are all useful for modern applications. So what are some pain points? Well, traditional databases didn't meet the speed requirements, the high availability requirements, or the scalability requirements for these modern applications. And NoSQL databases, on the other hand, have improved additional, uh, have provided additional flexibility and agility. At Couchbase, we support SQL, and we also have SDKs for all the leading la languages that allow developers to use the Couchbase platform without uh, negating the skills that they already have. So they can utilize their current uh, application development skills within our platform. And then we also have a mobile suite of um, products that support mobile application development. And then we do all of this with lower TCO um, because of our industry leading performance. Couchbase has three offerings. We have a uh, Couchbase server, which is our self-managed offering, and it's available on all the top cloud providers, the top cloud vendors. Um, it offers maximum control and customability. It allows you to leverage your DBAs and existing DevOps teams, and you can choose the management strategy and tools that you want to utilize. And generally, our customers deploy that via Kubernetes. We also have a mobile suite of applications that allow for offline first data access and peer-to-peer -peer syncing. So that means that uh, IoT devices can sync between each other and then they can upload back to Couchbase server um, when that uh, uploading uh, is available. And then we have automatic data conflict resolution. Uh, this is very important because as edge devices are collecting data, that data needs to be maintained and then you need to be able to determine which data is the freshest, which data is most current. So we do that automatically. And Couchbase also offers a database as a service, Capella, uh, which needs no administration. So it makes it easy to start developing applications. It's fully managed, uh, no maintenance required on the customer side, upgrades are handled automatically which means a faster time to market and lower TCO, again, because of our industry leading performance. So what are some key features that make Couchbase different? Well, the Couchbase platform includes capabilities and services that support different functional requirements in a single database. So we have services like eventing and analytics and full text support full text searching, um, which are available within this single platform. And this helps to minimize vendor sprawl. 
Coach Space is also fast, uh, memory first architecture and automatic replication and synchronization all the way from the edge to the cloud, help us to speed up uh, development times. Couchbase is also flexible. Data is stored as JSON documents, as I mentioned before, that gives the developers flexibility to um, change the schema when needed as the application requirements uh, change over time. And then Couchbase is familiar. So customers can move from a traditional database to Couchbase NoSQL platform, but they can still model relational entities in the Couchbase platform. For example, objects like schemas and tables are available in Couchbase using scopes and collections. And then Couchbase is affordable. Uh, things like multidimensional scaling allow us to scale the cluster based on the workload. So that helps in improve uh, efficiencies. So I'm going to run through the last few slides Basically, they talk about performance and how Coachbase performs in the YCSB benchmarking. Uh, we outperform our, perform our, our competitors tremendously. The last few slides talk about customer stories. So I'm not going to get too detailed into those stories. Again, this uh, presentation is going to be available after the session. So folks can go back and take a look at the particular details on these customer stories. So now I'm going to turn it back over to our uh, moderator. Thank you very much, Rick. Okay, well, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker for today, Mike Frasco, Field Chief Technology Officer at Reltio. Welcome to the broadcast, Mike. Hello, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me today. So my name is Mike Frasco. I'm a Field Technology Officer here at Reltio. Um, today we're going to have a little discussion around um, some of the common challenges that legacy MDM master data management tools have had in powering modern applications, both in real time performance and at the scale that modern businesses operate. So today in the business landscape, we have hundreds of applications. Uh, Gartner says that the typical enterprise has about 446 different applications uh, that they leverage across their enterprise. That means 446 different versions of the truth. 446 different places to store information about your customers. Uh, and that's extremely challenging to manage all of that data in a, in a normal enterprise. Um, Forrester actually says that 91% of organizations say that it's challenging to actually use this data for data insights, and less than half of their decisions are actually made using real data. So legacy MDM uh, and legacy master data management products we're there in order to provide a single source of truth for customers to be able to bring in data about your customer information or your partner or supplier information in one place. Um, but we see that they failed to live up to modern business challenges and they failed uh, in three primary areas around real time performance. Uh, at some point, it becomes extremely cost prohibitive to scale real time performance on uh, on prem platform. It's more hardware costs, more infrastructure costs. Um, it's expensive to hire giant services teams or consulting teams to come in and, and build out new, uh, new additions to your, your master data management platform. It's cumbersome to edit. Uh, oftentimes we need to go out and we need to hire uh, whole teams to come in and just do an upgrade or just apply a certain patch or just bring in a new source of data via an ETL tool. Uh, those things are things customers don't want to spend the operational costs on anymore. And then deployments are lengthy. Deployments can take up to a year, two years, three years to actually deploy. They're hard to process. They're highly manual as part of that, that implementation process. Customers want to get value out of their investment immediately within a, within a week, not year or two years down the road. So modern master data management is built around solving these problems. Um, here at Reltio, we have built our platform from the ground up in the cloud. Uh, we have done that uh, primarily to solve these problems around real-time performance. So we leverage the power of the cloud to scale horizontally in order to make sure that applications can directly connect to the RELTIO platform and make real-time application calls so that real-time customer data can be available in your mobile app, can be available in your analytics environment, can be available in your IVR system for your call center, anywhere you really need that data. Uh, we focus on business agility. So uh, our upgrades are pushed real time with no downtime to your environment. Uh, we'll later talk about some customer stories around upgrades, 
But these upgrades like I said, can take anywhere between six months and a year for legacy MDM platforms. We do this live for our customers with zero downtime. You don't need to have an outage window for a weekend or a week in order to deploy this. And then we offer uh, pre-built solutions in order to provide immediate value within weeks versus years uh, for MDM. So we've taken those common use cases in different industries like pharma and uh, financial services and deployed full packages that have a built-in configuration, built-in integration technologies, built-in matching. Uh, so you'll have to deploy that and get value out of that immediately within the RELTO platform. So you know that's just my words, but we're going to talk a little bit about what our customers are saying and what they're doing with this data. Uh, so Fulton Financial is a, a bank a bank that is actually uh, manages about two hundred or twenty five billion dollars in revenue uh, for, for their customers. They had a challenge with their legacy MDM platforms uh, where they were able to get customer data, but weren't able to surface that to the places that needed it, along with things around transactions and interactions and all the other stuff that customers are doing with them as a business. Um, and so they tried to rethink how to approach this problem, and they chose Reltio in order to make sure they could bring in transactions and interactions together and surface them live to their customers. And we've done this for some other retailers as well uh, and what, what they're doing. This is a, a large athletic company uh, based in the US. Uh, they have about $6 billion in revenue, about 240 stores worldwide. They had a challenge where they wanted to improve the guest experience for all of their guests and customers as they came in from every channel, whether you're calling them, whether you're walking in a store, whether you're online or in the mobile app, they wanted that customer data and preference information available live uh, for all these different applications. So they built out what they call their guest information hub, uh, which is powered by Reltio. And it has a single place for all guest attributes, all guest transactions that happen and all relationships between different guests uh, that happen across their enterprise. They have about 9 million different guest profiles they manage as part of this, and they do between 3 million and 18 million calls per day against the Reltio platform. Uh, and we are performing those in under 250 milliseconds. So these are applications that are being serviced with customer data live in real time. This is not every day. You heard, we'll talk about you know, data being available a day, a day old. This is fresh data as it's happening uh, within their, their business. So the second piece that we've seen there are master data management platforms have, have failed to deliver to, to modern business needs is around operational costs. Um, this is uh, National Grid, uh, which is a customer of ours. And National Grid is one of the largest utility companies in the world. They are based uh, in the U eastern coast of the US and in Western Europe. And they use Reltio to manage all of their partner, supplier and customer information and make that available to all of their applications across their enterprise. Um, they had a challenge around managing all of the technical debt and costs around upgrades and just patches for things that they have to get done. Security is a very large concern for National Grid, so security patches are, are really important for them to deploy. And we have another customer that has very similar kind of outcomes in, as part of their use case. Uh, this customer is a, a life insurance company uh, and they had a legacy MDM platform they were going to have to go through an upgrade process with. As they looked at this upgrade process, it was costly and lengthy, uh, and they decided to actually move towards Reltio, towards a modern data platform. They ended up avoiding a million dollars in expenses for this upgrade, uh, both $700,000 towards their legacy MDM tooling, but another $300,000 just to the database side of this tooling. And this doesn't include any of the infrastructure tooling that they would need in order to meet real-time performance they'd have to build out. Uh, so leveraging Reltio, they were able to save all of those costs since we publish all of our updates and our upgrades live with zero downtime, with zero uh, involvement that customers need to be, the customers need to manage. And the last piece, kind of, the, of those three pieces around, you know, where we see real impacts for, for business is around time to value. So you make an investment in an enterprise software, you want to get value out of that as fast as possible, right? These are not cheap purchases. These are expensive purchases for a lot of companies. Um, and so they want to make sure they're, they're extracting that ROI immediately. Uh, we have built the platform around making sure that we can take those common use cases and deploy them as full solution packs right into your tenant immediately on day one. So you can start extracting value, whether that's cleansing addresses, whether that's matching data for your customer profile, whether that's making it available in your analytics layer. And we deploy our services methodology through iterative 
uh, modules in order to make sure that as you take on new domains or new capabilities, you can deploy them rapidly and get value out of each of them individually without waiting those two years to get everything done at one big bang, which was typical for, for legacy master data management products. So as part of that, our customers that have done these things and have done real-time performance and have, have focused on time to value and really focused on operational cost reduction, they were able to get an 80% efficiency gain for their data analysts and their data science professionals. These are people that spend 80% of their time typically around just wrangling data and getting it in a format they need in order to actually do their real job. Uh, they've effectively been able to remove that, that work so they can focus on actually doing analysis. Uh, we've seen that uh, a customer of ours, uh, Dodge Construction Network, was able to increase their opportunities within their client base by 30% uh, by being able to identify customer trends effectively using Reltio and be able to service that data to their marketing platforms. Uh, and then we have a global beauty supply company that has been able to make faster decisions and roll out new projects faster uh, because they have access to actual customer data and trends in real time versus waiting a week uh, or days or weeks for them to have that, that data surface to them. And as part of this overall process, uh, we've worked with Forrester. Uh, Forrester did a, a total economic impact study that was commissioned by Reltio to evaluate the factors that affect an investment decision for a modern master data management platform. Um, that includes the cost, the benefits, the flexibility and risks. And what they did is they spoke with a number of customers that are both in the B2C and B2B space uh, and looked at that in order to calculate out overall ROI and NPV and basically the impact uh, that customers are getting out of the platform. They found that they gained a 366% ROI from their investment in a modern master data management platform, an NPV of $13 million and a payback period of less than six months for their initial investment in Reltio in order to, to get back that, that ROI. So, we think that these capabilities are really compelling for businesses uh, and really enable you to deliver the positive business outcomes that you need for your enterprise. So thank you and uh, turn it back over to our moderation team. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay, it's my pleasure to announce our next speaker. Again, Anais Dotis Joju, developer advocate at uh, Influx Data. Thank you so much, Stephen, and thank you, Rick and Mike. Um, so I wanted to focus uh, my section on powering modern IoT applications specifically. So a uh, little bit about me, I'm a developer advocate at Influx Data. Um, I have two cute cats that I hope brighten your day a little, and I encourage you to connect with me on LinkedIn if you want. All right, getting into the agenda for today, I really wanted to focus on the requirement for building um, and powering modern IoT applications is the ability to query, manage, transform, and process, as well as alert on your data on the server side for increased performance. And then I also wanted to speak about managing data from fleets of IoT devices at the edge to centralize instances um, and vice versa, and how um, InfluxDB provides these capabilities to help power modern IoT applications. But uh, before we begin uh, going into that detail, I just wanted to give a little bit of background and context about InfluxDB. Um, InfluxDB is a time series database platform. And first, in order to understand what that means, we need to think about what time series is. So time series data is any data that has a timestamp um, associated with it. And it's usually data that changes over time. And there are tons of examples of time series data. In the physical world, we see things like sensors, temperature sensors, for example. And in the virtual world, there's a ton of different examples as well. But um, an easy one to think of is uh, maybe monitoring digital assets or shares um, or containers or VMs. Also, to understand the requirement and necessity for a time series database specifically, it's important to contextualize that within the history of other databases that have preceded the time series database category. And so essentially what many people found was that other conventional databases on the market were just not cutting it. Um, each database in the market excels at their own categories and can store time series data, but they're just not built 
with the requirements that you need to effectively store the large volume of time series data that are typical for time series use cases, or have the built-in capabilities to process time, time data, work with time across different time zones, um, and manage the time series data lifecycle. So this is what uh, InfluxDB offers. Um, there's really kind of two or two main products, um, Telegraph, which is a collection agent for metrics and events. Um, it is open source and there are over 200 input plugins. So you can gather data from a variety of different sources and write it to a, different, a lot of different sources as well. Um, it's configurable through a single TOML configuration and it offers you a bunch of features like um, caching and buffering. So if you have a challenge of collecting data from a variety of different sources, whether that's mobile apps, web apps, devices, sensors, databases, or networks, and sending that to any other database, including IntellectDB, highly recommend using Telegraph. Then there are over 14 client libraries that you can use um, to build and write your um, IoT application on top of InfluxDB. And then there's InfluxDB itself. InfluxDB is not only a time series database, but also contains a visualization layer um, for creating dashboards around your time series data and a query and task engine that allows you to completely manage and pre-process your time series data. I say pre-process because a lot of times users might want to perform really specific machine learning uh, problems on top of their time series data. And you can use InfluxDB to pre-process and clean and do a lot of different things with it. Um, and then maybe send that data to uh, the data warehouse of your choice. So I also wanted to specifically talk about the advantages of managing data server side or close to the, the database itself. And this brings me to one of the kind of first requirements when you are thinking about building an IoT application and what requirements you might look for when you are evaluating what database to use. And so the first thing is that you gain a lot of performance benefits from processing the data server side. And if you're going to be processing time series data, you need to be able to manage the time series lifecycle. You need to be able to perform downsampling or create materialized views of your data. So you only retain the raw high precision data for a short amount of time and maintain aggregates for a longer amount of time. You need to be able to alert on your data and monitor your application as well as the sensors and the data that you're gathering from your IoT devices itself. And then you also wanna be able to take advantage of unified APIs to control um, all of your instances um, so that you can run InfluxDB at the edge um, or in the cloud and take advantage of that. And the way that you manage um, Influx, the way that you manage time series data within InfluxDB is through Flux. And Flux is a functional language that's designed for querying, analyzing, and acting on data. So what all can Flux do? It can do a ton. You can query your data. You can even query data from other um, different types of databases as well so that you are not trying to fit data in databases where it doesn't belong and you can bring in data ad hoc. You can filter your data, join data, change the shape of your data, pivot data. You can also analyze your data. You can perform anomaly detection, um, apply different statistical um, functions to your data as well, like correlation, for example, you can downsample your data, create custom functions. You can even act on your data. You can create conditional logic and HTTP packages to create actions on your data. You can create checks and notifications and send those notifications to third party endpoints like Slack um, or write data out uh, with HTTP or MQTT as well. Excuse me. So I also wanted to talk about um, scaling data management processes with API invocable scripts, which is another feature of InfluxDB. So this kind of meets a second requirement, which is just scaling that data management. One thing that you want to be able to do as an IoT developer is ex extend core functionality of the unified API of your database and have more control over it. The other thing that you want to be able to do is parameterize scripts so that you can easily duplicate, extend, and scale data management workflows or Flux scripts um, so that any sort of processing that you're doing with Flux, um, you can easily replicate and scale out. 
So what exactly is an API invocable script? So like most platforms, InfluxDB ships with a REST API, and this allows you to do pretty much anything that you can and control every aspect of InfluxDB, writing, querying, database administration, et cetera. And what many developers wanted was the ability to extend this core functionality with their own endpoints. And to do this, we created the API invocable scripts. So in its most abstract form, an API invocable script is a unique endpoint exposed by InfluxDB's REST API, which triggers a custom Flux script. <clears throat> also, if you're building an IoT application, a huge part of that is being able to manage data from edge devices and centralized cloud instances. And the way that we do that within InfluxDB is through edge data replication. And this meets the following requirement of IoT developers, which is that they need to be able to replicate data from the edge into the cloud or a centralized instance and vice versa, and be able to downsample the data as well and replicate that downsampled data. So version 2.2 of InfluxDB or InfluxDB Cloud introduces this new feature that allows you to automate the replication of time series data to other InfluxDB instances. Durable dispatch queues add buffering to withstand planned and unplanned disruptions in network connectivity. And in addition, this feature configures replication at the bucket level or in the database level if you come from a SQL background, so that developers and operators can precisely define which sets of data they want to replicate and where they want to send that data. And this replication also happens on write. So when time series data arrives at the edge and matches a replication rule, OSS immediately mirrors that data to the remote bucket defined in your uh, replication configuration. And then InfluxDB um, will also um, buffer those events in the instance that the connectivity is lost and store them in a durable queue. And um, we'll send those as well. So I wanted to kind of highlight some use cases of edge data replication. So here are some industry verticals um, that you would see edge data replication being used. Um, I'll just focus on manufacturing for right now. So um, maybe at your centralized instance of InfluxDB or your centralized cloud instance, you um, might have MES or CMMS um, systems or softwares or production orders. And at the edge, you might be getting sensor data from process control systems, equipment pallets, conveyors and lifts, et cetera. And there's a requirement that you be able to share that data and replicate it from the centralized instance to the edge and vice versa. When you think about retail, we think maybe um, point of sales devices at the edge or RFID scanners being able to communicate with um, centralized data like inventory and logistics and in-store pickup orders, et cetera. Um, and then for consumer banking at the edge, we have things like ATM machines um, and customer mobile apps, and we need to be able to uh, communicate that data with transactional systems um, and transfer requests, for example. I highly recommend if you have any questions um, and you wanna explore InfluxDB further, um, connect with us at um, Slack or take free classes at influxdbuniversity.com. Thank you so much and back to you, Stephen. Thank you very much, Anais. Okay, it's my pleasure to announce our final speaker today, last but not least, Mike Wong, Solution Engineer at Unravel Data. Hey, Stephen, thanks a lot. Um, hi, I'm, my name is Mike Wong, and um, I don't have any pictures of cute cats, just me today. Um, I do have a couple pups behind me, so hopefully the UPS guy doesn't uh, show up because they'll become very vocal. All right, so a little bit about me. Um, I've been at Unravel Data for almost two years now, um, having a background in big data, uh, working for Cloudera previously uh, to this role. So uh, this works out nicely for, uh, for, for me as far as the, uh, the technology goes. So um, let, me, let me set up the, um, our talk today in, in talking about um, you know, how, how Unravel Data can, can help uh, the data ops landscape. So is, the, the reason you guys are here is, is because, you know, you, uh, you have data and, and, and data is everywhere now and it's in every company. And 
you know, everyone is probably very familiar with, you know, the story of Amazon or Netflix and how they um, use data to to uh, to better market to their to their customers to us, right? You know, to to become better at at recommendations, at at selling things, and um, you know, UPS, you know, uses it to to to, to route, uh, you know, do uh, you know better routes for their for their drivers. And you know, as someone who used to be a delivery driver, I, I can I can attest that uh, you know these systems are very effective um, in. Um, being able to optimize, uh, you know, your your uh, your your package distribution and your logistics. So what I'm trying to say is is you know everyone is, is looking to uh, you know to get better at using their data, and and so that's that's where Unravel comes into play. Um, you know, but what does it look like now? Um, you know, looking at the landscape, if you see this diagram, it looks like an eye chart, but this is um, you know a very realistic uh, you know chart of of of, of um. Of, of of how 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 the uh, an, an IT organization may look these days, and and so what we have here on the left is we have you know where your um, you know where your use cases might be. So if you're a uh, a financial services company, you might be doing um, risk analysis or, or or fraud detection, or if you're uh, you know a a media company, you may be trying to understand you know do some you know some AI and machine learning around um, you know. The, uh, the, the your your viewers and, and what they're watching and how often they're watching it and when they're watching it and so um, that's all the, the use cases on the left and uh, you may be doing some ETL and that kind of flows into your data lake or your data warehouse depending on on how you're doing your, your data modeling and, and what you're doing with the data um, after after it's it gets stored and then from there it may you know flow to the right into a data science platform such as you know data robot or anaconda or into an ad hoc query engine you know, like your your Prestos and your um, you know your uh, your other other uh, you know even down to Microsoft Excel still people still use that these days and so you know this 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 uh, this this data stack while it's um it's manageable it's it's complex and there's a lot of different pieces running um, at different times and so you have to have uh, a large um, staff to support that you know to 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 build your your AI models and your your machine learning models, as well as you know, support the the back end, you know, all the infrastructure behind that, whether you're on prem or in the cloud, and and so um, that's the challenge of uh, of, of, of of technology uh, companies these days. And and again, the technology companies is is, uh, is is pretty much everybody. And and so you know, if if you look at this slide, uh, I'm sorry, if you look at the, the next slide, what you what you see is um, you see a, a, several roles that that didn't exist, um, you know, five or six years ago. S things such as you know a data analyst or a data scientist or or a, you know an architect or a, you know a, the the, uh, the you know the the uh, the fin ops role that didn't exist. And so all of these um, roles have a have a uh, have a have a, a uh, an influence on the uh, on the data landscape. And so you have. Uh, the application teams and the operation teams that are 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 you know kind of siloed in the way that they work um, because you know one one team is is building the actual models and the other one is is supporting you know the infrastructure behind it and making sure that these things are running if you're meeting the SLAs and uh, and whatnot and the challenge with a traditional um, you know uh, you know data ops in, uh, architecture is is that these these teams really need to be working together. And uh, and and with 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 the tools as they exist these days, that's that's not really possible, and and so these these teams are are kind of like um, doing a lot of finger pointing, um, you know, if you will, and and trying to uh, you know trying to get these uh, all of your AI models um, written and uh, and then deployed. And in fact, you know, I want to you know throw out a statistic that that we found earlier is that um, 87 percent of 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 uh, of ML models that are are written never actually make it into production, and uh, and it, it's not because they're 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 bad models. It's just that there's there's so much um, uh, you know d design work and infrastructure and and work behind it. It's it's tough to uh, to get all those all those all those models in, into production. So um, where where are we coming from, or where where we where we are now is um, where with the traditional DevOps tools, 
is, um, you know, they're, they're kind of like, um, you know, re, they're not kind of, but they are re, you know, re, re response request response type of models. So you're talking about your, um, your traditional APM tools, whether they're, um, you know, uh, new relic or, or, uh, or Dynatrace or, or app dynamics, you know, they're, they're, they're really, uh, written for the, for the, for the, 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 the data stack where you have from an e-commerce perspective or an application, a mobile application perspective. And so they're really good at that, that kind of performance monitoring, but uh, they're, they're not so well structured for the, for the, the, the data stack where you have, um, you know, machine learning, where you have, um, you know, different data warehouses and you may have some, some spark in the background and more of like a, a parallel processing type of, uh, type of uh, uh, model. And so that's where, um, you know, on, on Revel comes into play because it's, it's actually purely written for the modern data stack where, the, where you might have, um, you know, Spark, you may have some SQL and, and Kafka and you have, uh, you know, your, your data workflow engines. And those are really where, where Un Unravel tends to shine in, in that kind of capacity. Okay, so um, we we've kind of narrowed it down to, uh, to to three major C's as we call them, and uh, and 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 how and how Unravel tackles these uh, addresses these these different uh, challenges. So one, cost constraints and complex and complexity. The cost is is uh, is pretty self-explanatory. Um, you know you have a uh, you know you have your, your your budget overruns whether you're in the cloud or you're on-prem. Um, if these models uh, get out of hand or, or you know take up too much too much resources, complexity we talked about with the uh, with the modern data stack and being able to support those uh, those uh, those technologies that um, that really the the uh, request response um, uh, applications uh, can't can't really uh, um, mold themselves into, and then the constraints um, wrap around the constraints of of finding the people that are able to actually uh, you know support the uh, the, the 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 data ops uh ventures okay so if you could wrap all of those into uh into one application you would you would have unravel right so the ability to take a look at things such as your 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 cloud migrations or or, or monitor your your cost governance and that's something that um that even even uh, you know modern cloud tools that they do provide some ability to to monitor the cost but be able to to act proactively predict what that cost might be down the road based on usage and uh, and uh, usage models and, and patterns is something that's unique to Unravel. And then um, you know AI enabled optimization and advanced troubleshooting. So so really minimizing your your um, your mean time to resolution uh, by by aggregating all that all the disparate data around your your data stack into one spot and Unravel. And then being able to to quickly um, you know, do a root cause analysis on, on what happened with, with those those um, those applications if they're uh, you know over budget or if they're 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 failing outright, and then and then being able to optimize it from there, and then um, then coming back to the data quality and making sure that your data is, is accurate and precise and and something that you can you can you can put your weight behind and then you know use that moving forward. So those are the those are the the ways in which Unravel Data can. Can help you, um, you know, navigate the, the modern data stack, okay. And then um, to finish this off, if you wanted to see Unravel in action, we have uh, we have three ways to make that happen. First way is uh, through our website, just uh, unraveldata.com. Uh, you can also reach out, and we can do a demo for you. And I might even be the person that does that demo. And then um, if you wanted to try that on your own, you can create a a free account on. Um, on Unravel and uh, and and then you know go through our SaaS model and and kind of load your data in and we can we can run uh, we can run uh, some analysis on it in, in real time. Okay, um, with that I will pass it back to Stephen. Thank you very much, Mike. Okay, we're going to dive into questions from our viewers today. First question is for Rick. Rick, what feature do most Couchbase users value the most? Um, well, a few of our features, our features are very um, valuable to our customers. But one that comes to mind is the fact that we support SQL. So most uh, developers and a lot of analysts are familiar with SQL, and some of our competitors don't support SQL. So our SQL support is a key feature that a lot of our 
our clients um, really appreciate. Understood. Thanks, Rick. Mike, next question is for you. You mentioned some pretty large efficiency gains in development of data movement solutions being related to low slash no code development. Is that approach a viable substitute for batch ETL? Uh, you know, it, it, it as as the as the, uh, the the technology comes up to speed as far as like you know low code or no code, um, it, it it's actually it's improving significantly, and 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 that's definitely where Unravel can contribute to um, to the the the, the uh, economies of scale there. But at, at this point, uh, you know, batches is, is still um, you know still I, I still still we see a lot of batch processing out there. In our in our customers, and it's still a, a pretty a pretty very re reliable um, al alternative. Got it. Thanks, Mike. And uh, Mike Frasca, would you like to weigh in on that as well? Uh, sure. So what we've seen is that within uh, typical uh, customers that have legacy MDM tooling, batch based ETL was the primary uh, use for for moving data into and out of their platforms. Uh, both into MDM and then data warehouses. And we've seen a pretty dramatic shift uh, towards a, a focus on real-time connections. And we believe that uh, these low-code, no-code uh, tooling can provide that real-time connections in a way to to remove a lot of that, uh, that batch-based framework to make data more available at a much more rapid rate, uh, as well as reduce total cost of ownership of maintenance for, for those ETL platforms. Got it. Thanks, Mike. Okay, moving on, Anais, why not just use a relational database? Uh, that's a great question. I think it really comes down to the fact that the data is just vastly different in its needs and also scale. Um, with InfluxDB, for example, if you're on an R4 for Excel instance, you can write um, about 800,000 points per second with a dimensionality of around um, 10,000 different series. Um, so part of it is just being able to handle the capacity that time series data use cases typically require. But a large part of it is even if you're not, you know, um, writing a ton of time series data, you need to be able to do things like easily um, shift your, your time series data, round your timestamps, um, make sure that you're viewing dashboards in the same time zone as your colleagues that are across the globe. Um, you need to be able to automatically expire data. You need to have tools for um, downsampling your data and um, just accommodating all of the um, eccentricities of time series data itself. Um, but that being said, if you do have re uh, relational data, you should store that in a relational database as well. And if you need to merge the two types of data together, then you can use Flux within InfluxDB to query your data from um, a different uh, database and combine that data together. So for example, maybe if you were doing predictive maintenance on um, some sensors and you realize that something needs to be replaced, well, at that moment, then you could query your SQL instance and bring in information like um, maybe the purchase date and warranty information, for example, um, so that when you go and make a new purchase, you have all that information. And when you get alerted that this needs to be replaced, you can um, be informed with all the information that you need. Understood. Thanks, Anais. Mike Wong, our next question is for you. Across increasingly complex modern data architectures, how can data teams use data ops observability? Right, yeah, that's, that's a great question. And, and so, you know, you know, coming back to um, where the one slide where I, I talked about that there are a lot of new roles within IT organizations and being able to bring together, you know, the, the apps teams and the operations teams into, uh, into one application and, and giving them a common view of, uh, of, of, the, uh, of, the, of the, the data ops situations and being able to, to perform like your, your analysis and your root cause, your root cause analysis and your your mean time resolution in in one spot and and kind of eliminate the uh, you know the 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 finger pointing that goes around and when when a when an app fails um, that's that's uh, that's really where the, the power of of data ops and and unravel comes into play. Got it. Thanks, Mike. 
Okay, Rick, circling back to you, question is, what is the easiest way for a newbie to get started with Couchbase? Uh, good question. Um, so there are several options. The easiest way is prior to just download Couchbase and install it locally. That's kind of what I do when I'm doing some development type work. You can also install Couchbase on Docker. Um, that's a good idea if you want to uh, play around with different versions of Couchbase, for example. And then you can install Couchbase on your cloud of choice. So all the three major cloud providers and then self-manage the uh, database that way. But the easiest way and fastest way to get started is to go to um, uh, Couchbase.com. Uh, actually, it's Couchbase.com slash products slash Capella slash get started. That's, that's kind of long. But the point is um, that gives you the ability to set up an account on Couchbase and start using our trial version um, for free. Understood. Mike Frasca, why is real-time performance a critical feature required of MDM when it hasn't been a priority in the past? So I, I would say that it hasn't been a priority in the past primarily because it just couldn't be done. It was cost prohibitive to, get, to make this possible. Um, customers would typically be taking their master data management platform and then offloading all of that data into an operational data store in order to service that to their customers and building a big service layer around that to make real-time API calls. The, the management and the build out of that was just too expensive as they wanted to get lower and lower performance latency. The cloud has made this possible. Um, being able to access a, a SaaS platform with a REST API and not having to worry about all of that scaling management uh, has allowed customers to make direct connections to the single place uh, to be able to get that data faster and more accurately. So it's not that it just hasn't been a priority before. It just wasn't possible 10 years ago. Now it is, and customers want to leverage this data right at the edge of their, their customer experience. Understood. Anais, next question is for you. How much uh, can InfluxDB scale? So if you're using InfluxDB Cloud, you don't have to worry about scaling. Um, can handle... Um, thousands of uh, flux tasks, hundreds and thousands of um, points per second, um, and the ability to query uh, large amounts of data as well. Um, if you're using o OSS, um, you can look at the uh, hardware requirements for your instance size um, in the docs. Um, and if you go to the InfluxDB community, I'm happy to, to share those with you. Um, but I, the one that the one that I always keep in my mind is the the one I shared with you before, which is that you can write around eight hundred thousand points per second with a dimensionality of ten thousand series um, if you're on a R four four Excel instance. Understood. Uh, I love this next question. Um, I'm going to start with you, Mike Wong, but um, I'd love everyone's input on this. What is the biggest barrier for modern data teams to be successful? That that is a, a great question, Stephen, and we we actually get that uh, you know uh, uh, often, and um, you know, kind of going back to what we what I said what we said before about you know <clears throat> integrating you know all sides of the of the IT organization in, into one spot and getting them to um, you know work together towards towards um, you know you know it, 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 optimizing and um, you know their their applications at the same time. You know, minimizing cost is a is is a challenge that we we run into. Uh, you know, you know, actually, almost every customer. You know, most of them will come to us and say, you know, we've we've uh, you know we we're in the cloud and and uh, and we're we're just blowing through our, our DBUs if we're on on Databricks or you know we're we're, we're just we're, we're way over budget. But at the same time, you know, we have we want to we want to migrate more of our applications. You know, in into the cloud from our on-prem, and uh, and we just don't have the bandwidth to do it because either the 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 the, the jobs are need to be um, you know um, you know re re reformatted for the architecture, or they're they were they're just they're just not written in, in a in a in a in a way that that makes them optimal for uh, for cloud usage. And so, you know, bringing those two together and uh, and and really taking advantage of some of the technology. Um, within Unravel is is what is where we uh, is where we we we've seen the most challenges. Got it, uh, Rick. Any thoughts on this? The you know the biggest barrier for modern data teams. 
Yeah. Um, so f- what I see in, in the work with uh, Coachbase is vendor sprawl can be problematic. Um, what happens is uh, developers end up having to learn a lot of different tools for different proprietary systems. Um, with Coachbase, we try to handle that by offering different services. So we offer full text search services, um, eventing services, analytic services, and we have a mobile suite also from one platform. So you can get all of this from one platform utilizing um, familiar skills like SQL for querying, uh, which helps uh, minimize vendor sprawl. Okay, Mike Frasca, um, you know, would love your take on this. Sure, so we find that the typical barrier, one of the, the biggest barriers is, is integrating the business side to the technology side. Uh, and really making sure that we're aligned to the, the end end customer and business outcomes. Um, oftentimes it's really easy to deploy technology, but it just sits there. And so our focus is really around how can we uh, execute and deploy in those kind of meaningful smaller chunks to really start driving actual positive business outcomes and getting the business value immediately. So um, we, can, we can really tie in with that. Getting some small wins up front and building from there. Exactly, exactly. Understood. And Anais, how about you? Uh, biggest barrier for modern data teams today? That's a great question. I think um, some of the biggest barriers for um, teams is uh, being able to just effectively manage all of their different data and successfully prepare, clean, and uh, write and ingest their data. Absolutely. There's the, the variety certainly seems to keep growing in the sources. Um, so we've gotten through our attendee questions. We're almost at the top of the hour. But before we go, um, I have a question I'd, I'd like to ask each of you. Uh, you know, if, if there's one thing you'd really like our attendees today to come away keeping in mind, uh, what would that be? And why don't we start with you, Rick? Um, for Couchbase specifically, I would talk about our um, performance. So what we found out with running these uh, YCSB benchmarks that I didn't really get to get into too much in my presentation is because of the performance that Couchbase is able to exhibit, um, you end up running less hardware. So you can do the same work on Couchbase with less hardware, less nodes, which reduces your cost overall. So I'd, if I had to, you know, leave one nugget, it would be that the, the price to performance um, that you get with Couchbase. Understood. Mike Frasca, how about you? So I, I think I'm going to echo a little bit of, of Rick's answer. Right? I think performance is really key uh, at this point, you know, and for Reltio and for Reltio customers, uh, being able to have access to that data as you need it in real time. Um, directly from a single source of truth is paramount and um, the most important thing for them to be able to drive you know, real business changes or improve guest experience or improve marketing effectiveness. Um, that performance is just, uh, it's table stakes at this point. Understood. Okay, Anais, uh, how about you? I think for Influx, it's just that um, the ability that you have to completely manage all of your time series data, you can use Telegraph to write data to InfluxDB, but you can also use Flux to write data to InfluxDB um, and manage that with HTTP packages. There are native subscriptions, um, native MQTT subscriptions that you can use to ingest data um, and just the vast variety of methodologies and functions that you have um, to, to manage that data, control that data, and then also scale um, that logic and handle the really high use cases. Um, and then the last thing is that InfluxDB recently launched InfluxDB University, which offers free courses on InfluxDB, um, everything from Telegraph to uh, InfluxDB itself, to the visualization layer, to, um, uh, I think I said Telegraph already, to Flux as well. And um, all of those courses are free. And when you complete them, you get a free badge on your LinkedIn as well. So um, if you're looking for a great place to start, I would encourage you to check out InfluxDB University. Otherwise, come ask questions on the community forums or the Influx Slack channel. Um, I'd love to talk to you about what you're trying to do with uh, InfluxDB or in the IoT space. Thank you. 
Awesome. Okay. And uh, Mike Wong. Yeah. So last but not least, um, what I think I, I'd want people today to walk away and keep in mind is um, how are you doing your, uh, you know, your, 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 uh, your, your troubleshooting now on, on your data stack. If, if you're running Spark, if you're running, um, you know, Hive or MapReduce, like, you know, how, how are you doing that now? If, 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 if you're, when you're doing your, your, uh, your, um, your troubleshooting, your, your, uh, your, your, uh, your root cause analysis, if you're trying to understand, um, you know, where are you over budget with, uh, with a specific, uh, you know, application, or if, if you're on a, on a, on a cloud, um, you know, infra infrastructure, like how, you know, what are you doing now to, 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 uh, to, to, um, you know, to do that analysis or how you, how are you performing that, that kind of things or, you know, what, what team members are involved? Um, how many man hours are you using to, uh, you know, to, to do that, all that analysis and bring it, bring these, all this information into one spot to, pr to perform that root cause. And so, um, you know, bringing this back to Unravel, this is where Unravel, what really shines is being able to, to pr draw the data into one spot and, and, and really cut down on your, uh, on your frustration. Okay, well, I would like to give a huge thank you to our speakers today for coming on board and uh, sharing their insights and expertise. Once again, Rick Jacobs, Technical Product Marketing Manager at Couchbase, Mike Frasca, Field Chief Technology Officer at Reltio, Anais Gotis Choujou, Developer Advocate at Influx Data, and Mike Wong, Solutions Engineer at Unravel Data. If you would like to review this presentation or send it to a colleague, you can use the same URL that you used for today's live event. It will be archived, and we will send you an email notification once that archive is up. Also, as I mentioned earlier, just for participating in today's event, you could win this $100 Amazon gift card. The winner will be announced on Monday, October 31st. We'll let you know if you're the lucky viewer. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today, and we hope to see you again soon.